Hello, everyone, um, and welcome to the webinar. Um, thank you all so much for joining us today for the third installment of our Species on the Move webinar series. Um, my name is Kayla Ripple, and I'm a senior associate with the Lundfest Ocean Program. So for those of you that don't know us, um, the Lundfest Ocean Program is a grant-making program that funds ocean and coastal research projects and expert working groups to address the needs that are facing decision makers and stakeholders today. Um, you can learn more about us and the projects we fund at lenfestocean.org. And while you're there, you can also sign up for our newsletter. Um, and if you're on Twitter, be sure to follow us at lenfestocean. In fact, we'll also be live tweeting this webinar on the hashtag LOP webinar. So feel free to use it too if you'd like to engage with us there. We're excited to have with us today several members of a research team that are working with managers and stakeholders to better understand adaptive allocation strategies for black sea bass and summer flounder. So joining us today is Dr. Rod Fujita from the Environmental Defense Fund, Dr. Giuliano Palacios with the University of Wisconsin, Dr. Chris Dumas with the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, Dr. Ariel Levine with San Diego State University, and Dr. Katie Longo with the Marine Stewardship Council. Um, and I also wanted to mention a couple members of the research team um, that are also a part of this project. Um, Scott Crossan with the NOAA Southeast Fisheries Science Center is joining us today as a panelist and is here to answer any questions that you might have after the presentation part of the webinar. Um, and then also Dr. Olaf Jensen with the University of Wisconsin. He's not here with us today, um, but he is a, a member of the research team. So I'd be remiss if I didn't mention them. Um, today, our speakers will be sharing details of their new project, uh, which was an outcome of an ideas lab that we hosted in 2019 with the David and Lucille Packard Foundation and the Biodiversity Funders Group. The Ideas Lab convened researchers, managers, and stakeholders to generate research priorities around fisheries management challenges associated with shifting marine species. The result was a series of projects that could help advance understanding and solutions for fisheries management challenges associated with climate change impacts. Through our Species on the Move webinar series, we're exploring those projects. Um, two webinar recordings are all already online and on our website. Um, and our next and final presentation will be next month, launching a new project being led by Dr. Tim Essington with the University of Washington to understand barriers and opportunities for applying adaptive capacity in fisheries management. But for the project we're sharing today, um, this one is focused on the tricky topic of what to do when fish stocks move or expand across jurisdictional management boundaries. Now, I'll let the researchers dive into the details um, of their project. But for us at Lenfest, we're excited to be supporting this team. This topic is complex with multiple components and people that need to be involved. And the team is really taking a holistic approach to address questions around how to create nimbler mechanisms for reallocation policies that are fair and equitable for those which the policies affect. I also wanna point out that this webinar is what we like to call a launch webinar where the research team is sharing details at the start of their research so that they can better engage with audiences throughout the lifespan of the project, rather than just sharing their results at the end. And I think you'll quickly recognize, um, I think you'll quickly recognize the importance of stakeholder engagement from the presentations our speakers are giving. Uh, and we definitely encourage you to reach out to us at Lundfest and members of the research team if you have questions or would like to engage further. Now, before we get started, I just wanted to share a few webinar logistics with everyone. Um, with so many people in attendance, we have all attendees muted to prevent any feedback or echoes. There will be time at the end for questions, so please use the Q&A panel to type and submit your questions at any point during the webinar today. Um, I'll be keeping track of those in the queue, and at the end, I'll read them aloud for the researchers to answer. Depending on how many questions there are, we may not get to them all, but folks are welcome to follow up with us here at Lenfest or with the research team. And finally, we are committed to making Lenfest funded work transparent and easily accessible for all stakeholders. So we're recording this webinar and we'll distribute the link broadly afterwards. Please feel free to share this with others um, that may have wanted to attend today but weren't able to make it. 
And as this project goes on, we'll continue to share information on its progress via a variety of avenues, like on our website, um, in our newsletter, on Twitter, and other places as they pop up and seem appropriate. But for now, I've started creating a running distribution list for everyone who's interested. Um, if you're not sure that you're on that list, just send me a note. You can find my email on the slide here. And lastly, after you close out of the webinar, you'll be taken to a short three question survey about feedback um, for Lenfest outreach strategies for this project. Please take a few minutes to fill out the survey. Um, we'd be grateful for any feedback. Uh, it'll be helpful for us to better understand the best way to engage with you and others as we continue outreach around this project. And with that, um, I'll go ahead and turn things over to the research team. Uh, Rod, I'm going to pass presenter privileges to you. Thank you very much, Kayla. Can you see my screen now? Yep, yeah, it looks good. Yeah, thanks, Kayla, for that introduction. And then uh, welcome everyone to our webinar. I'm gonna kick us off here uh, by just describing the overall outline of the webinar. I'm gonna start with some project goals and describing our overall approach. And then uh, Juliana Palacios is gonna um, describe briefly how we're modeling the uh, distribution of uh, fish stocks uh, through time based on the trawl survey data that we do have and how we propose to apply some alternative adaptive allocation policies that put weights on historical catch and on stock distribution. Chris Dumas will follow that uh, by describing how uh, we propose to analyze the economic impacts of those different allocation policies. And then Ariel Levine uh, will talk about how we're proposing to co-create a common understanding of social impact of these policies with stakeholders and managers. And finally, uh, Katie Longo will wrap us up uh, with the description of our research that's aimed at identifying other fisheries that might benefit from adaptive allocation. Well, let me start this by saying the obvious, um, you know, fish are on the move all over the world. A lot of species are moving forward. Some are moving into deeper water um, as climate change affects the entire world ocean. And a lot of them are moving across uh, jurisdictional boundaries. Uh, the U.S. East Coast is no exception. In fact, um, some of the rates of movement are quite high uh, along this coast. This is an example, black sea bass, you know, back in 1972, uh, trawl surveys indicated uh, the distribution on the left, uh, concentrated down in the south there off Virginia, North Carolina. And now we're seeing a range expansion here in 2018 on the right, um, way up north. Now, as many of you know, um, the catch allocations to the states were based for many species, including black sea bass depicted here, are based on catches um, recorded from 1980 to 2001 as the baseline period. And this is what the distribution looked like in that period up on the top. But, you know, in more recent years, we see this poleward uh, range expansion and a uh, different distribution. What could happen? Well, um, hypothetically, uh, in the trailing part of the range, um, catches could be reduced um, uh, either in uh, the shallow waters or just generally in that whole part of the range. And fishermen who have allocations to, to catch that fish uh, could end up burning more fuel as they travel longer distances to catch them. Um, in a leading part of the range or in deeper waters where it's cooler, uh, catches could uh, increase. And if there's no regulatory structure in place uh, or the allocations are too small relative to how many fish there are, uh, you can see some discarding and unintentional overfishing. So the goal of our project really is to support uh, the fishery decision making process along the U.S. East Coast um, in the context of shifting stocks induced by climate change. Um, by looking at the potential impacts of adaptive allocation, which again is this sort of newfangled way to allocate stocks based on a combination of historical landings and the observed stock distribution to account for the stock shifts. Uh, we're going to focus on two species, black sea bass and summer flounder. Um, 
And because it's hard to predict the future and easier to sort of describe the past, our approach is really centers around a retrospective analysis of biomass distribution and how allocation schemes um, might be affected by those changes in distribution. Giuliano is going to describe that later. Then we're going to apply these different allocation policies that differ in these weights given the historical catch and fish distribution to see how the allocations would change. And then we're going to um, look at the economic impacts of those different allocation policies. And then we're going to do uh, outreach uh, with stakeholders and managers to co-create this understanding of what the potential social and, and economic impacts of these policies might be. And finally, we think that although our project is focused on just these two species, we believe that um, the adaptive allocation approach might be useful for many species that exhibit this sort of pattern of stock distribution shifts across boundaries. I'm going to turn it over to, to uh, Giuliano to describe the modeling work. Giuliano, take it away. Thank you, Rod. Um, hello, everyone. And thank you for coming here with us today. Um, as Kayla said, this is a starting uh, project. So um, I'm going to talk a, a little bit on on how are we uh, thinking on on approaching this issue. And basically, there's two. Uh, two concepts of, of the model and one is taking the fisheries uh, data and modeling the distribution of stocks um, that is right now we're thinking on we're, we're using the, the nmfs uh charles survey uh data but also thinking on, on using noise area monitoring assessment program so using those uh stocks data sets we and merging them with some spatial data uh we can Create the uh, the allocation. Uh, policy. The, the the issue that, or the step that we are right now on the spatial data is kind of moving from federal and state waters, uh, and how can we cover the whole distribution of the stock within uh, federal waters where there is not necessarily a uh, division per state. So uh, we're thinking on options like. Uh, just expanding uh, state waters off to the distribution and then uh, estimating how much of the distribution of the stock each state in this uh, waters, so, or also using ports, um, kind of expanding uh, the ports so we can also estimate other things like uh, distance from port and et cetera. The idea is that once we can, once we combine this fisheries data with the spatial data, um, we can now uh, talk about management rules, which was what uh, Ron just talked about. So, if we have a weighted historical versus current distribution of quota locations, and we could have a, a scenario where the quota is allocated on the, the rule already in place and 50% based on current distribution, or 10%, 90%, all of these are different options. And we can think on other things as well, like transition or static. Is this 50-50 for all the years or is going to start as 1090 and it's going to go every year or every five years towards 50-50? Uh, um, and we can also think on, on other things like quota thresholds, thinking, okay, so if the quota next year exceeds a threshold, then that excess will be uh, allocated based on distribution. There's many many uh, different options and we are uh, kind of balancing between having a complete model but also not having such a complex model that there's so many infinite uh, options that um, it's not that applicable so we are still exploring options and of course because this is a project that engages with looks for engaging with stakeholders uh, we are eager to um, to hear ideas or like rules that could be potentially explored uh, next one, please. So I'm gonna, uh, in the next slide, I'm gonna just show you briefly um, what we have. We have like a pilot of, of what the tool could look like. Um, so this is what we have until now. And what I want to focus is the quota location tool, of course. Um, 
the idea is that this tool will be easily working uh, logged in uh, in a server. You can use it in any web server and you can uh, play around with the tool. Uh, next. And next. So the, the tool right now is divided, let's think, and we have a control panel that works as a user interface where you select different uh, different options and then you have some type of output. So in this case, for example, we can say that we want users the fall or the spring US, the species in this case is selected black sea bass and then there's the scale of historical and distribution allocation where right now you say, look, it's 20 to 80, but maybe we can move it to 50 or to 90. And then we have, okay, okay, so what if we base this allocation on 10 years and 20 years on all the, the data set and we're thinking on different outputs so we could have a result by latitude that shows whether the stock is shifting or not an output by, by the distribution of the stock between that time and the idea is that eventually we would have a visualization of how the stock distribution is in each one of these states based on historicals so in the next one, I just we show an example of what would would look like. Um, so the expected outputs from this would be both biological and fisheries, stock distribution, state level quota. But we are also thinking on integrating some economic outputs like fishing from from quota, uh, maybe employment and other outputs that might be of the interest from stakeholders. Uh, the next steps for this for this tool is to well further develop it because it's uh, at an early beginnings. Uh, we will uh, just play around with it, see what works, see what doesn't work with them, what would they would like to see. Uh, I mean eventually we want to make a tool that it's useful for uh, stakeholders. And understand that it also includes understand or, or tag who will connect from this tool, who will use it, and uh, what our type of outputs are interesting. And we are circulating a survey, uh, I believe, in the chat. Kyla will uh, post it soon. And that survey includes questions regarding to the tool. So if you have ideas, opinions, options, and we're going to get more involved, uh, please. Uh, answer the survey or send us an email because, as we said, uh, this is on it in the early stages. We welcome any input. Uh, next one, please. Um, so, yeah, so this is just an example of uh, if we choose, I choose you the North US fall survey and then Black Sea Bass, uh, the uh, scale historic allocation right now is still not functioning. I choose all the year range, and this is a uh, distribution map. So, uh, just this is uh, the distribution of Black Sea Bass based on a triangular regular surface method, and then sh um, shows uh, what the output of uh, weight per catch per unit of of a fish. And that will be all for uh, for me, Rob. Thanks. Um, thanks, Juliana and uh, Chris. Take it away on economic impacts. Hi, folks. So I'll talk a few minutes about the economic effects of alternative allocation policies, part of our project. So uh, we're considering, you know, we want to consider different al alternative allocation policies and their biological and economic effects. And so there's some advantages of having a, an explicit, some have called it an automated allocation policy. Um, increased transparency for stakeholders, reduced negotiation and transactions cost. Folks don't have to go to as many meetings to, to argue about the policy if we have a nice explicit policy. And reduced uncertainty about future allocations. You know what your allocations are going to be. Uh, more certain in the future if you've got an explicit policy. But um, there's still some important uncertainties that need to be taken into account. Uncertainties about the overall level of stock abundance. Um, and then, of course, uncertainties about its distribution with climate change. Um, sometimes there are uncertainties about the, the allocation between the commercial fishery and the recreational fishery. Uh, for example, with recent changes in the MRIP uh, estimates, um, also some uh, interest in that. And also uncertainties related to discard mortality for different species and in different fisheries. 
And so as, as Rod mentioned before, we're going to take a retrospective analysis approach. Uh, we're going to look at some different um, um, potential policies and look at uh, what biological and economic outcomes we would, would we have gotten in the past uh, over a particular specified time period and then compare the different outcomes across these alternative policies. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's some of the examples of alternative sort of straw man allocation policies. Maybe there are others that we're potentially considering and if, and if uh, folks have uh, listening in today have suggestions for other policies we should consider, please let us know. One would be what we call a historical baseline policy, where we, so we base allocations on sort of 100% on historical landings. Then there's the dynamic reallocation policy, where we base the allocation um, on, um, on the biomass shift that's occurring in the species. Then there's sort of an intermediate policy where we might base allocation 50% on historical, 50% on biomass shift. Then there's a, a gradual shift or phase in policy where we start out with allocations based 100% on historical catch records in the past. Um, but then over time, over the time period, we gradually allow the allocation to shift from 100% historical in the beginning to 0% historical at the end. And at the end, we're using, we're basing allocations uh, solely on the biomass shift. There are some different uh, static trigger policies we could consider uh, where uh, there would be some catch amount and up to that catch, up to that catch trigger amount, allocations would be based on historical uh, information. And then past that trigger amount, some proportion, perhaps even up to 100%, um, past the trigger amount would be allocated based on biomass shift. And then another possible allocation policy is one that just maximizes economic value from the catch as just a, a point of comparison. Now there's also an option to potentially include some fairness or compensation mechanisms in any of these allocation policies, uh, perhaps buyouts or buybacks or quota trading across species, right? Uh, you give you give me some more black sea bass. I'll give you some more of some other species. So sort of some sort of trading across species potential. These are just some potential options. Next slide. So when we think about the different dimensions of economic effects, we're going to consider in the study. The first is economic value, and economic value uh, is composed of the commercial fishery value and the recreational fishery value. We could break down that commercial fishery value into the harvesters producer surplus and the final consumers surplus. Those are the final consumers of the, the seafood products. And then also the economic value of the recreational fishery, which is the producer surplus of the four hire charter and headboat owners, the consumer surplus of the four hire anglers, those who are, um, who are catching the fish on the four hire boats, and also the private boat and shore mode uh, anglers consumer surplus. Now, in addition to economic value, stakeholders and policymakers are often also interested in some other aspects, other types of economic impacts. And so we're also going to look at sales, um, also known as economic output. The sales is supported by the economic activity of the fishermen, the income that's supported, the wages, the salaries, the jobs that are supported, and also the tax revenues that are supported, local, state, and federal tax revenues. And so we're going to, okay, thanks. Next slide. Not only are we going to look at the direct economic impacts of these different economic activities from both the commercial activity and the recreational activity, we're also going to look at the so called multiplier impacts, the ripple effects of the fishermen's activity through the economy. We're going to, and under multiplier effects, we're going to consider both the supply chain impacts, those are the economic impacts on the, the fuel, the vessel, construction industry, the engines, electronics, bait and ice, all those industries that, that support the fishermen, as well as the distribution chain impacts, which are the downstream impacts, the impacts of, of seafood landings on seafood processors, packers, transportation, wholesale, all the way to retail, restaurants, seafood markets, and grocery stores. And we'll, we'll uh, base both the, our, our uh, studies of the direct impacts and the multiplier impacts on cost earnings studies that have been done, uh, looking at the cost and earnings of, of commercial fishing and recreational fishing, on angler expenditure surveys in the recreational fishing industry, and on the in-plan input output modeling system 
and software and data sets, which are often used to conduct economic impact analyses, not only in fishing, but in many other industries by economists. Okay, next slide. As far as the spatial resolution of our model, we're gonna report results by state, and if possible, down to the port level. We think we'll be able to do it by port. Um, we will, if we can, definitely by state. Uh, we'll use net present value to convert results from different years into equivalent values in a baseline year. So if you have benefits and costs incurring in different years, the value of a dollar is different in different years, we can use net present value to do that conversion to a base year. We'll also report results by fishery, so we'll report result, results separately by recreational and commercial fisheries within each state. And in terms of the data sources we'll be using, we'll be using um, commercial fishing cost earnings surveys, um, Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council fishery information documents, uh, NOAA Marine Angler Expenditure Surveys, the recreation side, and 2010 Summer Flounder Allocation Analysis that was done that provided some useful methodology that, we're going, we're, that we will be looking at. In addition to some other uh, estimates of economic value that are in the academic and, um, and the technical literature. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Ariel, the floor is yours. All right, thanks, Rod and Chris. Um, so after the uh, ad the adaptive allocation policy options have been developed and, and evaluated, uh, we plan to engage with stakeholders to get a more complete understanding of the challenges associated with cross-jurisdictional stock shifts and the strengths and weaknesses of the adaptive allocation scenarios that we develop. We will present our project outcomes to the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council Advisory Panel for Summer Flounder, Scup, and Sea Bass and Black Sea Bass during one of their regularly scheduled meetings or webinars. These panels are comprised of fishermen and other industry representatives who would potentially be affected by adaptive reallocation policies. The advisory panel is a standing group of fishery management advisors, so we felt that presenting to this group is appropriate because they're accustomed to thinking broadly about how fishery management decisions regarding our two target species impact their industry. We will seek feedback from the advisory panel members on the social implications of the policy op option outcomes. Uh, um, and specifically, we will ask for stakeholder perceptions of potential unforeseen consequences for livelihoods, well being, and the integrity of communities, as well as about how different stakeholder groups may be differentially affected by the different policy options and desirable solutions that might reduce hardship or inequities that may occur as a result of shifting stocks and reallocation strategies. This information would provide managing agencies with added feedback regarding where conflict might arise and what specific issues might generate conflict if adaptive allocation policies were to be introduced, as well as provide insight into potential strategies for mitigating negative social outcomes. I can pass it on to Katie now. Thanks. Thanks, Ariel. Uh, and thanks everyone for joining us. So I'll tell you a little bit about the um, analysis that Rod just hinted at earlier, where we're going to look for other places where this approach may be useful and potentially provide some uh, useful options. If you can go ahead, Rod. So we call this our hotspot analysis because we're interested in finding um, other locations uh, starting from the US, but potentially in other parts of the world as well, uh, where there are potentially similar uh, contexts, similar circumstances that might make this a useful and feasible approach. So this is going to be a rapid uh, type analysis. It won't be uh, in depth, but it will be mostly based on desk based information, perhaps some uh, key informant information to get a sense of where uh, the study might uh, use next. And we're looking for, uh, for example, other places where there might be conflicts due to stocks shifting across management boundaries uh, that might be already, um, already evident or might uh, potentially emerge uh, in the near future. And also uh, where there are similar circumstances, uh, Ariel mentioned some of the decision making uh, aspects and uh, that we might that we might be looking into and Chris mentioned the the types of scenarios and the potential utility of having automated allocation rules so we'll look for other places that 
have those circumstances as well, uh, and where perhaps there's a window of opportunity because there's an interest in revising the current policies and adopting some new uh, types of rules. And lastly, we also want to uh, look for places that will have similar types of data available. So you heard from Giuliano the kind of uh, information on the stock distribution and also uh, the type of uh, economic data uh, from Chris that can be useful and potentially readapted with uh, uh, some site modifications. So, for example, we're looking at the structure of the uh, recreational versus commercial, but there could be other kinds of structuring of the fishery that might um, be suited to this type of analysis. And if you can go ahead, Rod. Uh, our call to you is if you have some interesting stories, you know of uh, fisheries that might have these requirements, might be hotspots, if you can take our survey. Um, I believe Kayla uh, has put the link in the chat, so you can go to that link and uh, you can provide us with some of this, um, these stories if you're aware of them. Uh, or you might also provide some advice to Giuliano uh, on um, interesting ways to modify the allocation tool. Uh, and you'll also have a link to this, uh, to this survey if you want to take it in an email, follow-up email to this webinar. And with that, I'll give it back to you, Rod. All right. Thanks, Katie, and thanks to all of our presenters. Um, Kayla, I'm going to turn it over to you for question and answer. All right, that sounds great. Um, thank you so much uh, for that great presentation and a lot of really good information in there. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again with everyone's contact information. Um, just so if any of the attendees want to get in touch with the research team, um, you'll have that information and as you heard, um, they definitely want to hear from you, so don't hesitate to reach out. All right, so we had a few questions come in during the uh, presentation, so I'll go ahead and get to some of those initial ones, and please do feel free to add your questions um, right now. There's a little Q&A box in the corner, so there's a chat box and a Q&A box. I'm mostly monitoring the Q&A box, but I'll also be looking at the chat box, um, uh, not as frequently as the Q&A. So if you want your answer or your question answered, um, try to put it in that Q&A because that's the one I'm looking at most closely. Uh, it's kind of hard to, to look at both of those at the same time. Um, so here we go to the first question, which I think is in reference to um, the economic analysis. Um, here we go. Uh, can the model separate the private angler sector from the charter slash for hire sector? While both are components of the re recreational fishery, there are fundamentally different drivers and outcomes between them. Thank you. Hi, this is Chris, Chris Dumas. Yes, we do plan to separate the for hire and the private sectors. <clears throat> so we'll be taking advantage of um, the MRIP data that exists, but also data from um, from other surveys that have been done by NOAA, and also um, information that's in the um, academic studies to to separate those those uh, economic impacts because they are very different. Thank you. Great, thanks, Chris. Um, our next question is: How will the potential social and community impacts be presented to decision makers? Is there a plan to quantify those impacts or will it primarily be qualitative? Ariel, you wanna take that one? Yeah, I can take that one. Um, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, our plan is for it to primarily be qualitative. Um, when we were coming up with the project, we, we were hoping we might be able to do more of a quantitative impact analysis and expand that component, but um, given our available resources, at least for, for the project right now, um, the main way that we'll be getting input will be from the advisory panel and um, will be qualitative through interviews and um, focus groups with them and present kind of interactive presentation of, of our preliminary outcomes. Um, 
And so we'll be using that to at least have a qualitative understanding of the potential in impacts of the different allocation scenarios. Um, but um, it would be great to have a more in-depth study. We just don't have the resources to do that um, at this time anyway. Great, thanks Ariel. And thanks for the question too. So it looks like we're getting a lot of great questions in here. Um, our next one is about the economic component of the project. Um, it says economics, analysis output in terms of state and fisheries, recreational and commercial. Are you intending to break the fisheries component down by gear type as the impacts are likely to vary by gear? Hi, thank you for the question. This is Chris Dumas again. Uh, yes, we are uh, to the extent possible. We can get the data. So we'll probably have gear type categories, and, uh, but we will try to break uh, break down the analysis by gear type. Um, I know we have uh, some good information by gear type uh, down in North Carolina. I just did a study on that, so I know we've got some good information there. And there are also some uh, studies that from the northern area of the study study region that we can use. So we are going to try to do that. We might not be able to hit every gear type. We'll probably have some gear type categories, but we will try to separate those um, to the extent that they're you know, significantly different in terms of their economic impacts or their their impacts on the on the fishery. Thanks. Awesome. Um, all right. Our next question says, "Thank you for this talk. Uh, this is an incredibly important project." Have you considered how landing permits will play a role in your analysis? I know New Jersey fishermen who fish summer flounder in federal waters off the coast of Connecticut, um, but they only have permit to land fish in North Carolina, which will count towards the NC quota. How would changes in state quota impact the fishermen? Would they have to get a landing permit up north? Chris, Scott, or Ariel, maybe you can tag team this one. Hi, uh, so this is this is Chris again. Thanks for the question. As far as the, the economic impact um, sort of uh, aspect of that question goes, so where the fishermen are based, where their home port, that's where we would do the um, the uh, the backward linkage. Uh, impacts the supply chain impacts fishermen are tend to, to buy their supplies there in their home port. So the supply chain impacts would occur there. And then if they, they land their fish in a different port, say in a different state, that is where the, the distribution chain impacts would occur. Their landings would occur there and then they'd go into the distribution chain in that state. So supply chain impacts in your home port state distribution chain impacts in the state of landing wherever you land. As far as how the permits, whether the permits would be allowed, uh, I'm not sure that may be more of a political question. We could look at several different scenarios where we you know, do and do not allow the fishermen to obtain the permits in the different states. Someone else um, who may be f more familiar with that issue, if you chime in here, that, that would be great. Thanks. Yeah, this is Scott. I was thinking on this question. It's it's a really good question. The, the difficulty is that it's a regulatory question. That we're we're trying to come up with a modeling system that's potentially applicable in a lot of different areas and trying to examine what would be the biological and economic impacts. We're trying to think about how the the regulatory systems that are in place right now would have to shift to adjust for that is definitely something that that bears some some thinking. But it's definitely also something that regulators would have to confront. Great, thanks. Um, did anyone else have anything they wanted to add to that? All right, hearing none, I will move on. Um, so this next question says, I heard the suggestion that trading allocations between states across different species could be a potential solution. Are there examples of fisheries where this has been done before? You know, I'm, I'm thinking about um, Northern Europe, Katie, maybe you have some insight into whether there's transboundary trading there. And there's a couple of treaties I know about for international stocks that have a flexible kind of um, trading scheme to account for variations in stock distribution. 
Um, but uh, does anyone want to speak to that? Well, I'll just come in I that can... I'm not aware of the that there's um, compensation for for lost uh, catch. As far as I know, there's definitely uh, agreements, but I I don't think there's buyback. Yeah, I would, for in the Northern European country, I wouldn't think about buyback schemes. Yes, I was thinking more about just transfers uh, uh, between states um, allocation. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, can you hear, all hear me? This is Juliana. Yeah, go ahead, Juliana. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so there is there are some uh, bilateral. For uh, if it's uh, caught a uh, herring. Change your car. But it's more with the herrings in another one. Which species it is. Of areas where you can, uh, can fish in this region. Um, the so things like that are. Uh, Um, Juliano, your audio is breaking up. Um, uh, breaking up. Oh, no. Did it, was it completely impossible to hear my answer? <laughs> uh, we heard bits and pieces of it. Um, if you want, maybe you could type it in the chat box and we can move on to the next question. I just yes, wanted to see again. Yeah. Okay, great. And Scott, I think you had something to say as well. Yeah, I just wanted to add that I, so on the short term basis right now, I think states already do some trading of quota through ASMSC for things like summer fonder. You might be mistaken on that, but I think that there is some of that short term swapping already existing. Great. Thank you. And this is Chris Dumas. I'll hop in just here at the end of this. And if if it if it is possible, um, then that might be a way to do some compensation without sort of direct monetary payments needing to change hands. You know, if we if we can uh, swap quota uh, across species, that might be a way to, to get at some of the equity and fairness issues um, without having to to uh, move money around. We can just move quota for different species around. That might have that might help. So even if it hasn't has not been done in our study region in the past, we might want to look at a scenario where that that just asks the question: What if you know? What if what if that were possible? Would we could we see significant improvements in efficiency or in equity using that method? And if it turns out some some significant improvements could be made, then that might be something that fishery managers might want to want want to look at in the future. Thanks. Excellent. Um, do any of the other panelists have anything they want to add to that? All good. Um, okay, so our next question, I think, might be getting more at some of the uh, models that were shown at the beginning. Um, so, Rod, maybe this question's for you. Um, but have there been any efforts to model rain shifts based on other IPCC uh, scenarios or current energy emission scenarios? Yeah, thanks for that question. <laughs> There's quite a bit of research going on right now, including modeling efforts um, to kind of transform the IPCC results, which are, you know, in turn based on the, the general circulation models for the whole world ocean and coupled to the atmosphere. So these, these studies take those outputs in terms of projected uh, increase in temperature uh, around the world at kind of a coarse resolution. Um, they also uh, put out things like uh, anticipated pH change because of ocean acidification. Um, and the current crop of projections um, really center on trying to anticipate this, what's called the suitable thermal habitat. So where are the thermal conditions? Where are temperatures 
going to be within a range that a species can tolerate. <clears throat> and so, because we know what the physiological range of tolerance is for a lot of species, we can sort of ask and answer that question. The problem with that is that, you know, <laughs> the fish don't respond just to temperature change. As we all know, they, they need habitat, they need prey. Um, they can move deep, they can go forward. They have lots of different behavioral responses, different life stages have different temperature tolerances and different pH tolerances. So there's a lot more that goes into determining where a fish population is actually going to end up as a result of climate induced change. But um, the suitable thermal habitat is uh, certainly a good start at trying to answer that question. And I don't know, Juliana, if you're still on, your audio is working, but Juliana knows a lot about the, the current crop of models for projecting um, stock shifts due to climate change. Yeah, I, I hope my audio is back, but I don't, I don't really have a much to add, but you cover it all. Um, uh, a question, yeah, me to jump in. Great, thanks. Um, okay, so Rod, this question might be more for you, um, but we can open it up to really all panelists. Um, but could you speak a little bit more to your timing for bringing this to the advisory panel? Um, for some people, this is the first time that council staff are hearing of this plan. And so I think maybe uh, describing the timeline for engaging with and um, sharing the project with the council and the advisory panel might be some some good information here. Yeah, I'll take a crack at that and encourage others to chime in, um, particularly you, Ariel, if you want. Um, <clears throat> but my thinking is that, you know, our timeline really, we, I want our timeline to be sensitive to the, the management needs, right? So we don't want to just dump um, some research results on you at, at any old time. <clears throat> we want it to be at a time when you, you know, have the bandwidth and uh, have uh, the motivation to um, to consider it now. Um, our our uh, current understanding is that these issues are under active consideration, and so um, this kind of research might be informative um, in the one to one year to eighteen month time frame. Uh, and that's you know it's going to take about that long for us to complete uh, these analyses and and test the model. And produce results that are you know, suitable to present. But um, anyway, Ariel, you want to add to that? Um, sure. Yeah. Um, in terms of our timing, um, I mean, our plan is to to present this after we do have the the scenarios developed. Um, I think that um, Olaf Jensen, one of our uh, team members who couldn't be here today has reached out to to Bob Beal to inform him of this project, but we don't want to be taking too much of your time until we actually have some you know, results and scenarios to present. So I think, you know, in our at least in our, our current version of our timeline, it would be around late fall, but we are planning to try to coordinate with you know, a pre-scheduled meeting. So we're not scheduling additional meetings for the advisory panel to to have to attend um, and try to incorporate this into into something that's already scheduled. Um, so hopefully it would be late fall um, this year if we manage to stick to our timeline. But some of that depends on at what point we've we've finished the 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 different uh, scenarios and economic analyses. Thanks, Ariel. And I would just add uh, that um, you know we in this seminar at the beginning of our research we presented some hypothetical. Policy options, I think Chris showed a slide with some guesses at what the adaptive allocation policies that might be interesting to the council uh, and to stakeholders might be. <clears throat> but we'd really like to work uh, with council staff and uh, the Atlantic States uh, commission and stakeholder bodies to make sure that we're um, testing uh, policy options that make sense uh, in your context. Great, thank you. And thank you for the question as well. Um, this is more of a comment and it kind of builds off of this last question. Um, but this person is suggesting that if possible, uh, they would recommend that you reach out to the fishermen and industry beyond just the advisory panel 
um, which is weighted heavily to the historical fishery, but doesn't include enough northern representation. Um, so something to take into account and just wanted to mention it here for our panelists. Thank um, you for the recommendation. <laughs> thanks, Ariel. Um, okay, so the next question asks, how will you incorporate area of harvest versus state of landing? I know many commercial vessels will travel. Oh my gosh, sorry, I'm getting so tongue twisted. Um, I know many commercial vessels will travel off other states to fish, but land where they have quota. Do you need to right. I can, I can take that one if my microphone is working well. Otherwise, I'll just type it in. No, go ahead, Juliano. Um. Thanks, thanks for that question. And this is actually now as we speak. Um, right now, we're thinking on two approaches. One is um, expanding state waters um, up to the distribution, and then what kind of dividing uh, the area based on, on that expansion and accounting for some time, doing some weighted method to account for overlapping. Um, and the other approach is doing the same expansion, but from uh, the main fishing ports, um, and so doing the the same uh, the same the same. The idea is basically the same: expand and, and grow. Uh, it's it might not be that elegant, but I'm, I mean, in, a, in an ideal world, we um, you could have a whole other project to. Put a, a bunch of stakeholders on a map and try to divide um, waters beyond uh, the state level to allocate. But that this is the approach that we have right now uh, thought of. Great, thank you. Um, so our next question um, is speaking to the current efforts uh, for the summer flounder of black sea bass um, allocations that are up right now. Um, so this question is, will you evaluate the changes to the allocations for summer flounder and black sea bass that were already approved by the MAFMC and the ASMFC? I think we could do that. Um, I know it's been a recent decision, but um, I don't see any reason why that could not be a policy option that we could evaluate. Um, Juliana or Chris, you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, I can. I can jump in. I mean, that's something that we have definitely thought of. Um, in the the, I, I guess it's the benefits of doing a retrospective analysis. Is that you can kind of compare how would the quota would have been allocated based on different uh, methods and years and, and see how things were changed where we're different and, and, and things like that. I don't know if uh, Chris, you want to add anything else to that? Yeah, we could certainly look at that as one of the possible um, alternative scenarios. And this, this is the kind of feedback that is really useful for us. Um, Feedback on on which policy scenarios would be most useful, and most informative, for fishery managers and policy makers. You know, we have some of our own ideas based on our own experience, but it would be great to hear from folks listening in today. Thank you so much. Okay, um, so we have five minutes left and eight questions. Um, so I'm going to try to get to as many questions as we can, um, but if we, for some reason, don't get to all of them, uh, and you really wanna have a conversation about this or ask the researchers this question, please feel free to reach out to them or you can follow up with us at Lundfest and we're happy to continue the conversation and keep it going, um, but keep, I'll keep moving on. Um, so next question, great presentation and interesting project, thanks. Regarding the Heimcast spatial modeling, how do you envision disentangling the path dependency of the stock with the historical allocation? For example, would the stock dynamics and distribution have developed over time and space in the same way had the catch allocation and realized fishery response to it been different? Um, 
That sounds like right. a question so, for bilateral modelers. Yeah, right. So um, we are going to, the idea is to look at the distribution of the stock and the quota, the quota allocation separately to see um, to see exactly that, um, those discrepancies and differences, if I understand um, your question correctly. Okay, um, next question. Can you explain how you would model allocations for the recreational fisheries? These species do not have historic catch allocations by state or region, but have been managed through different state measures like seasons, possession limits, and size limits. Uh, this is Chris, uh, right? So one way of looking at that is to look at what the historical catches by the recreational fisheries have been and uh, as a proportion of the overall catch and sort of define that as the implied historic catch allocation. And that would, would be sort of a baseline baseline situation, a baseline scenario. And then we could look at uh, changes from that. If the recreational sector had caught a larger percentage or smaller percentage, um, how would um, how would that have affected things? So that's that's one way we could look at that. Thank you. Have you considered economic allocation methods such as quota auctions? This is Chris again. Yes, yeah, there are a number of different uh, economic allocation methods that we're that we're looking at. Um, some of the scenarios would just consider uh, sort of allocation methods that are imposed by the, the fishery by the fishery managers um, and sort of different uh, command and control imposed allocation methods but we could also look at some more sort of dynamic methods like looking at uh, quota quota auctions um, a potential method and there's another the method we're also looking at that's similar to a quota auction in that fishermen would submit bids but it takes into account both the, the efficiency of the allocation and the, the equity or fairness of the situation. Uh, and so we're looking at doing, hopefully doing one or two scenarios using that, that method as well to see how it affects, affects, affects results. But yes, we are definitely looking at economic allocation methods. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, so we're getting close to the end of time and we still have a number of questions left. Um, so I'm gonna actually copy all of these questions and give them to our panelists um, so that they have that information because some are comments as well. Uh, but again, please do reach out to the panelists here um, or to us at LenFest. We're happy to keep the conversation going. Um, I'll also point out again their, uh, the link to the survey in the chat box. Well, we've recorded this webinar and we'll be sending the recording along with that survey link as well, um, which I think will be really helpful for this research project and all of our speakers and the research team here today. Um, so if you have a few minutes and can fill that out, please do. Um, this is actually a separate survey from the one that you'll get in your pop-up screen. Um, so again, we'll be sending out the recording and the link to that, uh, that survey that the research team is working on um, in a follow-up email. Um, but with that, we, we're right at the, the top of the hour, so we're going to go ahead and end the webinar. I, again, want to thank all of our panelists and speakers today. Um, we are, we're so grateful to have you here to be sharing this project with us. And thank you to all the attendees. Um, really appreciate you taking an hour of your time to um, to participate and engage with this webinar. Um, so thank you, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day. And hopefully, we'll be in touch. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. <laughs>